Okay. Uh, this, this is supposed to be a debate, but it's not really a debate format. Uh, I'm just going to give my uh, view on arthroscopic... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is not the debate. We're doing the... I got, I got the order mixed up. Okay, this is our post-op stiffness and other complications talk. Okay. Um, th this is my disclosure. I'm a consultant and get royalties from Arthrex. Um, <clears throat> when you think about post-op stiffness, um, if you look at uh, the theories of what you're going to do post-op, if you do post-op immobilization, you should get enhanced healing, but with an increased likelihood of stiffness. If you do vigorous early post-op motion, you're going to get a greater risk of re-tear, but a lower incidence of stiffness. So uh, these are just two uh, diametrically opposed uh, theories. If you look historically, what was done uh, for the small and medium tears, typically there was early passive uh, aggressive range of motion so the shoulders wouldn't get stiff, and that's carried over somewhat into the arthroscopic realm but prolonged immobilization in these airplane splints for the large and massive tears. Um, typically, the results were considered good if pain was re relieved. Um, the motion was often poor, even with good results. And if you go back even as recently as 1991, Doug Harriman's classic article where he basically looked at cuff healing, but if you look at what they considered good results, the post-op shoulders with intact cuffs averaged only 122 degrees of forward elevation. They call that good results. Um, and in those days with open surgery, you could not do any releases for stiff shoulders uh, like you can now with arthroscopic releases, so you had to accept that. But I think in 2009, most of us would agree that an average elevation of 122 degrees uh, is not good and it's probably not even acceptable to most people. This has been my uh, rehab protocol for the past 20 plus years, but I'll have patients in a sling uh, for six weeks, no overhead motion for six weeks. I'll let them do uh, external rotation at 45 degrees or so. If, if they did not have a subscap repair, at six weeks we start to, to begin overhead stretch, and at three months we begin strengthening. And the reason for this is uh, various things in the literature. Uh, immobilization enhances the mechanical properties of tendon healing. There's uh, literature on that. Immobilization promotes parallel, stronger collagen formation in healing tendon, so those are in favor of immobilization. Passive overhead range of motion creates strains great enough to cause the cuff to fail. Just passive overhead ele uh, elevation. So that's against uh, early motion. And then Sonderman's classic study in, uh, in primates where he showed Sharpie fiber formation uh, doesn't occur until at least three months post-op. So uh, the luxury I've always thought we had with arthroscopic repair is that we could have prolonged immobilization with much less chance of stiffness. And that was a huge advantage over the open surgery. So there wasn't really a big push to get this, this early motion going. So we looked, la looked uh, about three years ago, Dave Huberty was my fellow, and we looked at 489 consecutive uh, arthroscopic cuff repairs with six weeks of immobilization. And we uh, we're very hard on ourselves on stiffness. If the patients weren't satisfied with their motion, even if it was just some lack of internal rotation, and uh, we uh, call that a failure and a stiff shoulder, 24 people decided to undergo arthroscopic release. And out of those 24, 23 of the 24 were completely healed. These were the high-risk groups uh, for stiffness that uh, uh, the single tendon tears, the smaller tears, the combined pasta slap repairs, calcific tendonitis, and a concomitant a cuff and labral repair. Um, all the 24 who had a secondary uh, release regained full motion, so that's an excellent uh, uh, procedure for regaining motion. Uh, 23 of the 24 were completely healed at the second look. It's almost as if they had overhealed, and none of the larger massive tears developed stiffness. Um, we then used that information to, to start a second stiffness study where we took these high risk groups that we talked about, started immediate closed chain overhead table slides to get overhead motion, but closed chain so we'd have more protection against activation of the muscles. And the passive external rotation we'd been doing, this is actually our outdoor uh, physical therapy arena where we take some of our larger patients and show them to do, how to do their exercises. But uh, our hypothesis was that this early overhead closed chain stretch and passive external rotation would decrease the incidence of stiffness. So since then, we've had 200 consecutive cuff repairs that we looked at, 
early stretching in these high risk groups only, and we had only one post op stiffness requiring arthroscopic release. So, this is one half of 1% incidence. So, uh, we feel like that these criteria for the early closed chain overhead uh, stretches were validated, and this is what we use now. Still, uh, this immobilization for all the others. A corollary to this is that uh, patients over about the age of 35, if they have a slap lesion, I prefer to do a biceps tenodesis rather than a slap repair because uh, that we have a much lower incidence of stiffness that way. What about other complications of shoulder arthroscopy? Infection. Isikos in the late 90s, uh, when I was chairman of the Upper Extremity Committee, we had a, a complication registry. We had uh, 60,000 cases of shoulder arthroscopy that were registered, and we had uh, four uh, infections. So, one in 15,000 incidents of infection, shoulder arthroscopy worldwide. DVT, uh, in, uh, in the last uh, 6,000 shoulder arthroscopies I've done, uh, I've had uh, four, and look at this, three of these. One was in a doctor, one was in a doctor's wife, and uh, one was in the doctor's tennis partner. It was the same doctor, his tennis partner. So, I don't know what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> neurologic complications, um, the beach chair position, there's been a lot of uh, talk among anesthesiologists lately about hypotension and stroke, and I know uh, some of them don't even like to give anesthesia in the beach chair position. I, I prefer the lateral decubitus, I've been doing that for years, um, but that's, uh, you know, just something to be aware of. Hyperextension of the neck has been reported to cause some radicular problems as well. Uh, loose anchors, I prefer uh, screw-in uh, PLA, PLLA anchors. Uh, you don't really see much problem anymore with loose anchors. Uh, persistent defects uh, or re-tear, uh, there is a, I, th I think this is important. People talk about re-tears in the literature, but I think there are persistent defects where there actually has been partial healing or maybe there's some leakage from an arthroscopy portal. That's not a re-tear. So, I think we have to look at what real re-tears are, but there are re-tears, obviously, and I think that one of the reasons is failure to recognize a tear pattern, as we talked about earlier, and you repair things under too much tension, and they fail. Failure to provide an adequate vascular bone bed, because as you saw, the uh, primary source of uh, blood supply for healing is coming from the bone, so you've got to get a good uh, vascular bone bed. Technical failures, uh, poor knots, uh, a repair of bursa, I think this is a bigger deal than people think. I think a lot of times guys will look in and see some tissue that looks kind of thick and they just hope it's cuff and put some stitches into it and we'll talk about that more. Failure due to biologic insufficiency, I think this is just sort of an excuse that some people are using to say why they're a failure or they have failures, let's blame it on the patient. But then there are people that have poor quality tendon, poor quality bone. But I think that uh, that's used far too often as an excuse. Causes of persistent pain and weakness, failure to, to diagnose, I think, is an important one, and particularly in, in regards to a subscap subcoracoid pathology, some of the biceps pathology. Spinal glenoid cysts, if you don't get an MRI, you're going to miss these. And uh, in fact, uh, I started getting MRIs years ago on every patient I'm going to operate on because I missed a spinal glenoid cyst because I didn't have a pre-op MRI. But if you look at overall in the medical profession, the leading cause of malpractice claims among family practitioners is failure to diagnose. And I know there are some cases more recently where surgeons are beginning to be held accountable for misdiagnoses when they uh, later get uh, something operated on that supposedly was a misdiagnosis. This is uh, a person that failed uh, cuff repair. Actually, he healed his supraspinatus, but they missed this uh, subscap tear with uh, a uh, biceps uh, dislocation, and this was done with a mini open repair. Well, this is a very difficult area to see mini open, and it wasn't picked up on the MRI, so the patient continued to be symptomatic. So you need to, I think, at the very least, even if you're going to do a, a, an open repair, look in there with a scope to be sure you don't miss anything. Uh, failure due to iat iatrogenic injury. Uh, chondral injury can be a mechanical thing. Uh, I think as we get better, that's less and less of a problem. Chondrolysis, you've heard about from uh, some of the pain pumps, speculated to be local anesthetic. These are tor terrible complications when you see them. Uh, the old thermal's not used much anymore, but I've seen problems with that as well. <clears throat> I think the new problem we're seeing more 
or that I'm seeing is nerve injury. And I see it from people who think they're supposed to dissect the brachial plexus and do a suprascapular nerve release on uh, patients every time. And uh, my feeling is that uh, you never dissect the brachial plexus arthroscopically. I can't think of any indication for that. And uh, I'm very selective in suprascapular nerve releases. I think they're only indicated in patients without a cuff tear who have EMG-proven suprascapular nerve lesions. And I'm sure there'll be more on this later. But uh, uh, there is a, a, a school of thought out there that says you need to release the nerve in every uh, cuff tear. And I know Buddy Savoy is going to talk about this more. And I'm not sure what he's going to tell you. But this is just my philosophy about it. I think one of the biggest complications is failure of the surgeon. We just need to, to strive to improve our skills. We need to strive also to improve our diagnostic skills. And one of the things here that I just want to drive home is about revision surgery. Is it actually a revision repair, or is it really the first real repair? And I think one of the problems we get into is there is kind of a false cuff. It's a thick bursa. and. Uh, and you've got to recognize the false cuff, because if you do a bursa repair, it's going to fail 100% of the time. So this just shows you a case where we're breeding the false cuff. This was a failed cuff repair, which I think actually was a bursal repair the first time. Big cuff tear. And you see the, a lot of sutures out here in the tuberosity. <clears throat> we'll just start to clean things up a little bit to get some of those out. I like to make a split. This is a right shoulder, posterior viewing portal. I like to make a, an internal deltoid fascia split and come down uh, to the bottom of this uh, lateral gutter. The axillary nerve is distal to that. Here's a suture that's actually in bursa. So I think as the bursa repair failed, the, the suture stayed in that, that part of the bursa. You've got to, to uh, reestablish the anterior gutter, posterior gutter, lateral gutter and then see what you're dealing with. Now, this looks pretty substantial, and I think this is probably the type of thing you had repaired before, but that's not cuff, and how do you know that? Because if you follow it lateral, it inserts not into bone, it inserts into deltoid fascia. So that's just a thick bursal leader, and that's going to fail every time. So now here's the tissue that inserts into the bone, and that's what you've got to get down to, and you've got to be fairly ruthless in getting rid of this trash tissue that isn't going to do you any good. And then if you have kind of this devascularized sort of peninsula of tissue that comes out here, you got to get rid of that too. And then you're left with something that's uh, a stable rim of tissue that realistically is something that can heal uh, if, if you repair it. And then you decide if you're going to do interval slides or what your strategy is from there. So in summary, uh, to get back to stiffness, you can avoid that, I think, in greater than 99% of cases if you use a selective stretching. Avoidance of complications requires some meticulous attention to detail. Recognize all the pathology that's very important. Nerve releases, I think, are seldom indicated. And uh, I think uh, you need to not blame things on biologic failure because some of these things are due to our own inadequacies. Thank you.